of the last panel, uh, but it pertained much more to this conversation. So I held it until now, and I'm hoping that um, both of you will have more to say about it, uh, having just rewatched the conversation. Um, uh, one of our audience members asked uh, Margaret and Gioconda in regards to the Nicaraguan women's movement, uh, what do you hope that historians take away from your story? It's a big question. I think Gioconda should go first since she's a Nicaraguan woman. <laughs> well, I think for me, the women's uh, liberation movement since the 60s, 70s, is the biggest and most important revolution of the 20th century. And I feel, you know, that we take that, we take that we were pioneers, that we opened the doors for many women uh, that were still trying to find their consciousness. And in the case of Nicaragua, I think Nicaragua has the most, uh, the strength of women has made this country what it is. And it keeps the hope and it keeps the spirit going, though we have a very, very difficult situation. I mean, and to be living through another dictatorship, you have no idea what that means after all the sacrifices that this country made to kind of get rid of one tyrant to end up with another uh, it's really very depressing and terrible. But women, for example, the, the, the women who have husbands in prison right now, we have more than 100 political prisoners who are treated very badly, who are tortured, who are isolated and in, in human conditions. And women have been talking about them. We, women have a very important uh, participation in the society. So that's, that's what, I, what I take away from what we did. I mean, it's not one thing, it's so many things. It changed so many things, but still like Margaret was saying, it's not like we have done it all. You know, we still have things to do. For example, we have in Nicaragua a very big problem with violence against women. And in all of Latin America, it's, it's a paradox that Latin America has had the most number, the, the largest number of women presidents. There was a time when there were seven women presidents, and yet we have the highest number in the world of uh, women who are uh, beaten and killed by men. So it's a domestic violence is a very huge problem in Latin America. So we still have a lot to do, but I am very, very happy of what we have done so far. You know, when uh, I heard you say, Shakonda, that uh, talking about the women's movement in the 70s and 80s, um, I, I agree with you. And I also think that the most important revolution in the world today is the revolution that women are making. I mean, look at, at, look at Spain, look at Chile, look at so many places. Uh, each place is different. And you have this terrible new dictatorship. We have now a handmaiden on the Supreme Court, you know, yeah, we're, no. we're risking uh, losing uh, women's rights to control our bodies and, and all kinds of things. So each country is different because we have different cultures, different histories. But I think that women are really at the forefront of, um, of uh, addressing these, these issues and also of realizing that there are so many connected issues. I mean, climate change and violence against women, as you say, and, and immigration and healthcare, it's all connected. Uh, dictatorship, the struggle against the rise of, of neo-fascism. Um, but I see um, the lessons from Nicaraguan women and other women in, this, in the 70s and 80s as being reflected, it's part of our history and we're building on it today. So, um, you know, I, uh, there's a, I see a, a question in the chat from Jules LaBelle and, and Karen Engro um, saying that both of us have lived through periods of great hopes and dreams. Um, 
And what hope and dreams do you still see today? And I think what we see, at least from my point of view, is the same issues. You know, we want equality, we want justice, we want uh, real democracy, not the kind that uh, inhibits voting and so forth and so on. So, you know, we still have a lot of work to do, but if, if, uh, if the earth exists, if the planet exists, I think we'll do it. Well, I think, you know, we are coming to a moment. Well, hello to Jules and Karen. Uh, we, we are coming to the moment where we have to make very important changes because if we don't, like somebody said, it's not the world that is going to disappear. It's the human uh, species. You know, we as humans are going to disappear. And uh, this pandemic, for example, it's very much a, 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 a sample of what we are going to have to face if we do not do something about taking care of the world. And that's where I think women are going to have a very important role because we have a chip for caring. We, you know, because of our biological uh, instinct and our biological role of bringing up life or taking care of life, I think we are uh, going to have to put that in service of the world so that we can all go back to all the things we have done wrong and not keep doing them wrong. So uh, it's very interesting that during the pandemic, the, the heads of state that did the best jobs in their countries were women. I mean, you know, they, I love, I am in love with Hazinda Ardens in New Zealand and, um, uh, you know, Angela Merkel, the, 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 Finland, the president of Finland, Iceland, Norway. I mean, it was very interesting to see how they took care of their own. And I hope, you know, that we were going to be able to take care of the world. And I hope in the United States, Joseph Biden wins so that, you know, Trump, that is, you know, a menace. We, get, you know, it's really a menace to the world, that guy. I mean, all the things that he's done to, to go back on climate change. So I really think we have to worry and we have to worry and we have to work. And like uh, uh, some women said to me when, uh, a long time ago when the Iraq war was going to begin and we had to do some, uh, some work together. And they said, you know, if you think you are too small to make a difference, you have never been in bed with a mosquito. <laughs> and I thought that was such a great saying. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd like to um, ask a couple of questions. I know we also have a, a question from one of our panelists waiting in the wings, um, but I wonder, uh, what uh, you consider to be the changing roles of academic activists in an increasingly shrinking and limited space. And I, it doesn't specify if we're thinking of the US or Nicaragua, but I imagine there, there is a space for both, answers to both. Well, I see um, the scholars that matter, the academic scholars that matter to me I remember when Barbara was talking about archives that matter, but the scholars that matter to me are scholars and activists. And I think we're seeing more and more of that. I know we're seeing more of it in the United States. You're a prime example of this, Liz. Um, Roberto Tejada is a prime example. I mean, there are so many in so many fields in history and anthropology, um, in letters, uh, in the sciences as well. And um, I'm not, uh, really familiar with what's happening in Nicaragua now in the academy, in the academic world, but I imagine it can't be, um, I'm, I know it must be influenced by the dictatorship, by the uh, Ortega uh, Murillo dictatorship, but I imagine that there are also scholars there who are tremendous activists. So I think the future of uh, the academy is absolutely in the hands of, uh, of scholars who see their role as being a dual role, as, as being uh, scholars on the one hand, but also activists who are uh, actively involved in trying to uh, look to change. I don't know what well, we have the oldest academic activist, uh, Carlos Tunerman. He's 86 years old, 
and he's still in the trenches, so to speak. And, uh, but it, you know, Nicaragua has suffered a lot in that regard because they have, uh, the university has lost its autonomous uh, nature and it's just a place where propaganda is being uh, dispersed uh, and not dispersed. Uh, what does it say? The, it's being given to the to the to the students. Disseminated. Disseminated. And so it's it's very sad. But you know what I am hoping for is for young people to become academics. You know, uh, I am worried about also the influence of the social media in the concentration in the study in all the 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 things that uh, demand a much more focused attention, that worries me. Because I think the, the tendency is for all this digital world, at least for a while, is going to kind of absorb the energies that otherwise would go to more uh, long lasting endeavors in, in, the, in terms of study and in terms of uh, sharing experiences in different communities. Yeah, we have that problem here as well. Yeah. I'd like to invite right now Roberto Tejada to um, turn on his camera and ask a couple of questions. And uh, that lets me read through the Q&A in the chat. Thank you, Margaret and Jaconda. It's been riveting to hear you talk. And I was wondering what I got a sense of the conversation between the two of you was that there was this incredible belief that change was possible. And so I was wondering if the two of you could talk us through what a day in the life of your work together in Nicaragua during that time. <laughs> because maybe the the day-to-day -day aspect of it could be a model for thinking about change in the present. Lots of coffee. <laughs> That's what I remember, lots of coffee, like 10 or 12 cups a day. Um, well, we worked together in media, and I think that that was very interesting for me. It gave me so much. Um, it it really taught me a lot because um, Giaconda was my boss. Um, <laughs> she was uh, my superior, and uh, and uh, your job, I guess, was to try to change media, um, television, newspapers, radio. Uh, to reflect the va values of the revolution uh, and everything from sitcoms to the news. And um, I remember you would send me to some of the television program uh, stations and I would, you know, work in that. But I, I learned a lot from you. I think um, uh, that, you know, um, you should talk about what the, that, that work was like. Well, you know, I studied advertising and journalism in in Philadelphia when I was very young. And uh, so I applied my knowledge or tried to apply my knowledge to change the perception that uh, the United States had of what was going on in Nicaragua. It was the Reagan years. We were in the Contra War. We were facing this giant machinery that was trying to, to uh, you know, to crush the Nicaraguan revolution and we had to do our most, to, our best to talk to journalists, to well, uh, to make them realize what we were going through, uh, to get our points across, get our story across. And I think we did a pretty good job in a way, you know, considering the circumstances, because uh, the United States never invaded Nicaragua at the end, and also because. Uh, people in the United States were incredible. There was solidarity, the solidarity movement in the United States was very strong to support the Nicaraguan revolution that we were going through. And I think that's another thing that is not talked about enough, which is how the Nicaraguan revolution, however, whatever else has happened now, changed the lives of so many people who got involved helping, you know, in solidarity. I mean, it was a time of a beautiful kind of uh, generosity in very, a lot of young people got involved. They came to pick coffee. The Nicaraguan revolution had a lot of charm really, no? And I think we all contributed a little bit to that charm because we were, it was not uh, inflexible. It was more relaxed. We were very young. 
it was we had fun also we drank coffee but you remember margaret we had that Ruth Spinola, she sent, she told me to say hello to you. We had this, this person working in the office who was uh, from the Dominican Republic. Was and she knew opera. opera. She was a, an opera uh, expert. And uh, she taught us how, uh, you know, to love opera. And she was, she didn't stop talking the whole day. And we also, you know, when I was sick, I remember one night that they came to my house. Not you, Margaret, but uh, Ruth and another friend, as I had to finish a report. And so they gave me Calvados. We all got drunk. <laughs> and we finished, you know, but we finished the report. I mean, we worked in very difficult circumstances also. But we loved what we were doing. And yeah, I think we that's loved what the we most were important. doing, and I remember uh, Ruth playing uh, opera arias loud. Um, so, um, so I just, uh, uh, yeah, I remember those days as being, and they were long days. I mean, they were eighteen-hour days, nineteen-hour yes. days, Very and long. Uh, it never seemed to us that. Uh, I mean, we just didn't have these hours of eight to five or nine to five because you don't make a revolution from nine to five. You, you it takes twenty four hours. It takes more. But yeah. um, I remember a lot of of wonderful moments from those times. And um, sometimes, you know, even today, I draw on the lessons that I learned back then. And you mentioned the how the. Nicaraguan Revolution brought people into it uh, with lots of solidarity movements and so forth. I think the Nicaraguan Revolution was really what also, at least in the United States, sparked so much solidarity interest in El Salvador and Guatemala. Yeah. Um, it started with Nicaragua and uh, the success of the Sandinistas in 79 made people here in the United States believe that perhaps there could be success in Guatemala, in El Salvador. Uh, and so forth. So, um, and there was success in El Salvador. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. there was. Yeah, so, no, know, I did I'm, such a good job when I was doing my job as a, you know, trying to change the perception of journalists that I fell in love with one of them. And I ended up living in the United States for almost 20 years. Now I am back in Nicaragua with the same person. And uh, it was, you know, I tell that in my, my memoir. That was a very paradoxical <laughs> thing that happened to me. But, you know, it was, journalists became also uh, involved in the, I saw some journalists crying when we lost the elections mm -hmm. in 1990. Yeah. It's fascinating. I cried. <laughs> because I think if I can follow up, there was also a change of perception in the mass media in America Latina as well. The last issue of, of El Corno is fascinating because there's a, an essay by Edmundo Desnoes called The Secret Weapons because there was a, a great suspicion of the way the mass media were being used to distort the perception of Latin America. But I think by the time of the Nicaragua, uh, uh, the movement, there was, a, there was probably a movement to change the perception of how mass media could be used even within the United States to, um, to, to change opinion and attitudes. Yeah. yeah. Roberto, do you have, a, you have a second question, I think? I do, if that's all right. I mean, I, both of you um, ha have been involved with the, the women's movement and, and feminism has changed radically in the last decades. I wonder if, I know, Margaret, you've translated a trans author, Chelly Lima, if you could talk about transgender activism in both of your contexts. Yeah, I think it's it's extremely important. I mean, I think one of the big um, problems that we all had, um, and uh, by we, I mean those involved in revolutionary movements in the 80s, um, in the 70s and 80s, um, I see when I look back, uh, one of our greatest problems has having been sectarianism. You know, we, we um, it was going to be everybody, but maybe we wouldn't talk about race or we wouldn't talk about gender yet. Certainly we didn't talk about um, about gay rights and much less transgender. I mean, they, those words didn't even exist for us then. Um, so I think that um, the fact that we did not include everybody 
And by everybody, I mean, not just in saying in the discourse, well, when the revolution is won, we'll deal with women's rights or we'll deal with racism or we'll deal with homophobia, but we didn't really incorporate those voices and those struggles into the struggle itself. And I think that was a big mistake. And I think it was partially uh, responsible for our failures. You know, what, whatever part of the failure can be uh, as ascribed to us. I know a great deal of it was, was of course the fault of the United States, but not all of it. Um, today, I would say that transgender, um, the transgender, right? The transgender people are sort of at the bottom of the ladder. You know, there's always somebody at the bottom of the ladder. So right now it's Muslims, it's transgender people, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's the people we can, as a society, push away or push down. And we just can't do that. And you mentioned uh, Shelley Lima. I did a, an anthology of Cuban women's poets, poetry in 1982 called Breaking the Silences. And Shelley Lima was the youngest person in that book. She was a young woman poet and I remembered her work well. And when I uh, got ready to collect uh, the poetry for uh, a more, much more recent anthology of Cuban poetry that I translated and edited called um, Only the Road, um, Eight Generations of, of Cuban Poetry that Duke University published a few years ago. I looked for Shelley. I couldn't find her. People had told me that she had left Cuba. And um, I, I did find him too late, uh, Shelley, uh, too late to be in the book. Uh, Shelley had moved to many other countries and then finally Miami and had transitioned to, to being a man. Um, I finally got in touch with him and uh, asked to see what he was writing at the moment. And it was so, uh, it was so profound and inspiring because uh, he had a book uh, that was all about the sort of psychological aspect of his transformation, not the physical aspect, but the, tra the, the psychological aspect. And it was wonderful poetry. And so I translated it and it was published by the operating system in, um, in, in Brooklyn. So yes, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always interested in who is in this category of humans that we push uh, to the very bottom of the heap, you know, uh, Muslims, transgender people, um, uh, immigrants uh, of all kinds, of all countries, um, because I think that's where we're tested to be able to understand the fullness of humanity. Well, in, in, in Nicaragua, you know, what has made the transgender uh, issue more visible is because some of the girls that were caught during the protests in, in April of 2018 were transgender, are transgender, and they were in the prison, they were put with the men. They are both women, and they were put with the men because, you know, they didn't accept that they weren't that they were women. And, uh, and so that kind of uh, put a, 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 a light on the issue and they got enormous amounts of sympathy from everybody. I mean, of course there is a reactionary conservative. I think it's a hard, like Margaret saying, it's something that it's going to have to become accepted by more people, uh, the more that they are seen, the more that they are recognized. Uh, you know, we are moving in these identity issues. We are not moving as fast maybe as we should, but I think we are moving pretty fast. I think part of the Trump phenomenon has to do with the fear that so many people have of this new ide identity politics, no? And um, so, but I, 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 I think that was, that's what happened in Nicaragua. It doesn't have a lot of attention, but we have we have an association of LBGT. I don't know how to say it in English, but you know, uh, and uh, and they are active, and so we will see. I think it will go well. Thank you. Thank you so much for those those important answers. I have a specific question for Margaret uh, that came through actually in the earlier panel. Uh, one of our 
listeners would like to ask whether you could tell us a bit about your relationship with Diane de Prima, given Diane's recent passing. I would be glad to and honored to. Um, just before I answer that question, though, I see that there's a question from somebody called Lisa Dollar. Um, and um, she asks, she says, somewhere I was told that Margaret Randall is supporting intervention by US military against Daniel Ortega's regime. And I just want to make clear that I am absolutely not supporting um, intervention by the United States against anyone in the world. Um, so, uh, so much for that. Um, in terms of Diane uh, de Prima, she died on the 25th a few days ago after a very long illness. Uh, she was an extraordinary poet. Um, I think that her revolutionary letters, uh, many, many, I can't even remember how many, but there were several volumes of uh, revolutionary letters, poems that, that under that title um, were so, were prophetic. I mean, they were published in the early days of, um, uh, Diane and I were friends. We were, uh, she was just two years older than me. So um, we knew each other briefly in New York and then uh, reconnected during the years of my immigration case. Uh, after 84, when I came back to the country, she read several times for, uh, for, in, in, for my case um, in defense of my staying here. Um, I also think that, and so I think that those revolutionary letters uh, of hers were, were fabulous and they're still very, very um, relevant today. Uh, another book of hers that I would recommend to people is Loba, incredible book. And another book uh, that I would recommend to people um, is her autobiography. Um, I can't remember the name of it now, but it should be um, very easy to find online. Um, she wrote it maybe I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. It's an extraordinary book uh, about an extraordinary life, but also a book that, uh, in which the 60s and 70s are particularly uh, reflected from a woman's point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Recollections oh, of my Saigo, life as a woman. Saigo tells us uh, that her book is Recollections of My Life as a Woman, which is uh, the title of her autobiography. Yes, everyone should read it. I have a, can I say something? Yes. I am really impressed with the work that our two sign language translators are doing. Yeah. I think sign language is such a beautiful thing to see. You know, to, I remember once in Cordoba, I was in a, in a poetry reading and there was a a, a, a person who was doing sign, sign language of the poetry and it was so beautiful. Thank you guys. You are doing an amazing job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much Efrain and, and Claudia. Really wonderful work. Yeah. We do have a few more questions from uh, folks watching. Uh, one asks you, the both of you, to um, compare your memoirs. Both of your autobiographies are, have similarities of honesty, humility, and introspection, but they were written at very different times. What do you two think are the similarities and differences of your memoirs? Well, I, I think one of the most important, I mean, I, I talked uh, some about Gioconda's uh, memoir in the conversation that we just had, and um, I think that the most, I think it's an extraordinary memoir, but I think that one of the things I admire most about it is when it was written. It was written 20 years ago. And uh, for those of you who weren't able to tune in to, the, um, to, the, to our conversation, uh, Jaconda was able to uh, talk about things uh, that were very, very difficult, uh, for many people impossible to talk about back then, uh, such as misogyny and, uh, the way uh, women were treated in 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 the Sandinista movement and in general, and so um, and it's also a beautifully written book. I don't know. What do you think, Shakonda? What do you think the differences are? are well, I think they are they are similar in many ways. I, I uh, in my memoir, I just chose to do a piece of my life which had to do with the, my joining and then 
joining the revolution and then moving to the United States after the electoral defeat. Margaret goes much more into her past, her family. I didn't do that. But in terms of our struggle as women to kind of make ourselves heard to the, 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 the obstacles we had, the, what our relationship to our children in the middle of all these, you know, topsy-turvy lives that we had. All of that is, has something uh, in common. And also the, the thought about the good and bad of revolutions. So I, I think you do it maybe more than I did, but I did began to, 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 to state questions about whether we had really done the revolution justice and everybody who died justice. And we were already seeing, I was already seeing the authoritarian uh, rasgos, you know, authoritarian characteristics. Uh, yeah. characteristics that, you know, later came to full bloom with Daniel Ortega because I wrote a memoir in 2000 and 2000. It came out in English in 2001. And uh, I had left the, the Frente Sandinista in 1993. I resigned because of the, of the, you know, the, 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 the way that Daniel Ortega was trying to uh, centralize all the power and, and marginalize what those who had really been in the revolution for you know, and being part and, and fought. So I have a, a, an opinion that I had since then about what was happening and how it was not going the way we thought a revolution should, should uh, develop. You know, what had happened with the electoral defeat, with the Contra War. Mm -hmm. I tried to make a critical, uh, reading of what of all those things yeah that's why i think it was so brave uh because i mean it's much easier to do that now in my book uh, i'm doing it in retrospect and so much of what we thought back then or began to think has come to fruition and we see it but it's in retrospect and you were you you had the courage to do it when it was still developing when very few people really understood that that was what was happening or made excuses uh, for the fact that it was happening. I mean, I can remember talking to people um, in the 90s about Daniel Ortega's uh, sexual abuse of his, uh, of his stepdaughter, Soy La Verica, and uh, saying, you know, a man who does that is not fit to be president of anything or, or even head of a family or anything. And people saying to me, people in the solidarity movement here said revolutionary people who, who fought for justice and so forth saying, oh, you know, but that's his personal life. That doesn't count. You know, we, we don't need to talk about that. And I, I always thought that that was um, just absurd. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I, um, I wanted to voice a question that came in earlier, and this one is for Margaret. Um, and it speaks directly to a section of your memoir where you talk about being raised uh, in the United States uh, in the middle class and not knowing you were of Jewish descent. And um, this brought to mind Jessica Krug, the professor who was passing as Afro-Caribbean. Mm -hmm. uh, in the discussion of the Randall archives, the idea of speaking for others was mentioned. And this uh, audience member is wondering how Margaret has managed to avoid speaking for others or speaking as the other, and rather has facilitated the ability of women to speak for themselves. Can you address that, Margaret? Well, I'll try to address that. I mean, it's a very, it's a very tough question, and I think it has to be looked at uh, historically. When I first did um, oral histories um, in the 70s, um, I was, you know, trying not to speak for the other. I was trying to let the other speak through me. Uh, but um, I was just learning how to do uh, oral history. And I don't know that I was always successful at that. Um, 
gradually many of these women uh, who spoke through me at that time uh, gained their own extraordinary voices and um, have spoken for themselves in books and articles and uh, films and in many other ways. So I think it's, it, it was something that evolved. I mean, I think that the work that I did was important and I'm proud of it at the time that I did it. But I think that um, at this point, uh, you know, we need to, and we can encourage uh, people with the, with the resources that we have today, we can encourage people, um, women and, and everyone to speak for themselves, uh, to speak about their own lives um, as the protagonists that they are. I remember when I first went to Nicaragua in at the end of 1979, just after the Sandinista victory, uh, I was invited by Ernesto Cardinal, and one of the things that he wanted me to do, and which I did, was to give a four-day course in oral history. And I remember Ernesto saying to me, um, you know, the, the students in this course are going to range from people who do not know how to read and write to people who have doctoral degrees. So make it broad, you know, and so I started out with you know, how you use a tape recorder and how you put people at ease and so forth, how you ask open-ended questions. But I ended up trying to explore some of the issues that we were talking about even back then, the, the ethics of, um, you know, how you present yourself, how you must present yourself um, when you do that kind of work so that the reader of an oral history will not only hear the voices that you're presenting, but know where you're coming from and what you're filtering those voices through. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of um, uh, the voices of others, um, I was going to see if Fiore uh, of Nicaragua would like to um, speak to the group. Fiore, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, well, I think I would prefer to speak in Spanish. Is that possible? Dale. Más. Dale. Oh. Great. Uh, bueno, primero quería decir a Margaret que realmente es un honor conocerla. Eh, a finales de 2018, yo por casualidades de la vida y represión de Daniel Ortega, fui a vivir en su casa en Los Robles, en la casa que ella tenía en Los Robles en Managua, y realmente ahí pude apreciar un poco de sus fotografías que todavía están ahí. Entonces... Fue interesante como para conocer otra perspectiva de la revolución y es ahora más interesante saber que está aquí en Albuquerque. Eh, bueno, mi pregunta era más que todo porque es una discusión que creo que es una cuestión generacional en Nicaragua y que Yoconda quizá nos podrá hablar un poco más, pero creo que hay mucha esa percepción entre los jóvenes de que sí, antes había una esperanza de poder cambiar las cosas de una forma que ahora ya no parece posible. Entonces, es algo con lo que yo personalmente lidio mucho y creo que mis amigos y amigas que ahora son exiliados también, eh, me gustaría saber como cuál sería su respuesta a cómo mantener la esperanza en medio de todo esto. Por ejemplo, entre Nicaragua, bueno, Estados Unidos y en varios otros sitios donde vemos ahora muchos refugiados, inmigrantes y, y gente tratando de hacer una vida en medio del caos. Eso. Mira, el otro día me dijeron una cosa, muchísimas gracias por esa pregunta. Me dijeron una cosa que me pareció genial, que era, eh, no se puede vivir en la utopía, porque es la utopía, pero no se puede vivir sin utopía. O sea, yo pienso que uno tiene que, te, que creer en que el mundo va a ser mejor. Lo que pasa es que lo que tenemos, digamos, las personas que ya hemos vivido a través de estos procesos, digamos, es que sabemos que tal vez no vamos a ver el resultado de nuestros sueños y empezamos a aceptar esa realidad. Esa realidad quiere decir que lo que hicimos no es que estuviera mal hecho, sino que los procesos de la historia toman mucho tiempo. Entonces yo creo que ustedes, como gente joven, se tienen que comprometer con su vida, con el presente, con el tiempo y hacer lo más que puedan para empujar el carro de la historia. A lo mejor no van a ver todo lo que quieren ver, pero eh, lo que es importante es saber que uno hace algo, porque lo más importante es que uno sienta que la vida tiene propósito, que la vida de uno, uno está aquí para hacer algo importante eh, y cambiar un poco la historia, ¿no? Entonces, eh, eso es lo que yo pienso que la esperanza 
en la medida en que hay esperanza se mueven las cosas, pueden ser difíciles, pueden no suceder inmediatamente, pero yo te digo, comparado con nosotros, cuando, eh, digamos los sandinistas cuando empezamos desde el 70, no había nada, no había, estábamos también luchando contra un ejército, eh, contra una dictadura, entonces uno tiene que creer que lo peor que puede hacer uno es perder la esperanza, porque mientras hay esperanza uno se mueve, pero yo te entiendo, o sea, te entiendo que es bien difícil y no, yo también me deprimo y a veces me parece que esto va a ser eterno, pero no es cierto, no es cierto porque los las mismas personas no son eternas. O sea, Daniel Ortega se va a morir. La Chayo también y se va a morir cuando vos no estés muy bien. Entonces, sí, Trump también, ojalá. En eh, última instancia. ¿eh? Yo creo que tenemos que tener esperanza, pero también eh, tenemos urgencia, ¿no? O sea, sí. no, no nos queda otra, ¿no? No nos queda remedio. Eh, tenemos que seguir luchando porque no hacerlo sería morir, ¿verdad? Exacto. Eso es lo que yo creo, sí. Yeah. Muchísimas gracias, Fiore. No, the voice of the youth uh, has spoken. Yeah. Um, and I, I appreciate those answers from experience. We were, we were all young once, but uh, these days uh, it's hard to remember. Um, we are approaching the end of our time together, and I know some people have had to leave. Um, but um, one of the questions that um, I thought was, was worth thinking about, um, well, actually it was a repetition of the hopes and dreams uh, kind of question. So I think what I'd like to do is thank you, uh, Gioconda, and thank you, Margaret, so much for all the hard work and preparation, um, as well as the joy and passion that you brought to this project of celebrating the Margaret Randall archives at UNM. Likewise, I'd like to thank all of the um, panelists who spoke earlier in the day. I know most of them are, are still online um, and uh, they did a wonderful job and hope that it, this has given us um, uh, new opportunities to connect, uh, not only through Zoom, but also through our archives, through our work, through our activism and um, in a closing uh, moment, I would like to um, uh, show you uh, who all, oh darn, sorry, uh, all of the people who have helped make this uh, possible from our technical support, um, our publicity work, particularly that of Marlene Linares Gonzalez, uh, the interpretation, which we've already celebrated and we celebrate again, uh, of Efrain and Claudia uh, with the support of uh, Tommy Tejeda. And uh, again, a big thanks to all of our, um, our public, our audience, for joining us this afternoon and uh, reminding us once again uh, of the lessons we learn and teach each other from these marvelous women uh, who spent time speaking with each other. Would either of you like to say anything in closing? Well, I just say thank you to everyone. The panels were great. Uh, Jaconda, it was just thrilling to be able to talk to you. I hope we can keep in, in close touch. Liz, your work in getting this together and solving all the problems um, that came up is <laughs> is more than astounding and the people behind the scenes as Joconda said the the uh, signers have been wonderful and um, so I'm just very very grateful and and humbled and and moved there were times when I was uh, fighting back the tears um, so just thank you for this afternoon thank you for accompanying us thank you to all yeah and I want to thank uh, Liz very specially because I feel that she worked so hard and she was such a champion for this event. And thank you for everybody to, that, that watched. And I was super honored and happy to be able to be with Margaret, to talk to her at length about all these things, about her memoir. And please buy her memoir, read it. It's very important. 
you are going to be very inspired. And thank you so much to the New Mexico University and to all the people who worked on this event. It was great. Yes. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Please stay safe and well, and I hope we can convene again sometime soon uh, safely. Take good care.